is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Unspoiled, the book club. Childhood favorites. Covering The Phantom Toll Booth by Norton Juster, which I thought was not a name. <laughs> In this book, which I had never read before, it's sort of like... If Neil Gaiman and Dr. Seuss decided to rewrite Pilgrim's Progress, hmm. I'm into it. Welcome to Unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha, and with me is my special guest. Hello, I'm Erin Ayers. Welcome, Erin. Um, and so you are from, it's amazing, because guys, if you are in the Crowdcast, you can see that there is a pile of board games behind Erin, which betrays what her podcast is about. Will you tell us a little bit about that <laughs> off the top before we get yes. into this book? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I am one half of Over the Tabletop, which focuses on reviewing two-player board games. Um, and we do games that work for more than two players, but we focus on ones that work very well for two players. Um, you know, it's very frequently hard to get like an entire game group going. Mm -hmm. So we focus on those. If you have two like really hardcore um, board game players, like you're, you'll, and you listen to our podcast, you're set. That's so awesome. I was um, talking about this upcoming podcast with Jamie, who co-hosts the Doctor Who show with me. And when I was like, for two player board games, she was like, oh, <laughs> oh, I want to know about that. And I was like, exactly. We get that a lot, actually. I mean, and it really is like a specialized thing to because it's one thing for something to say it works with two players. But yes. to have somebody be able to play it and tell you if that really means anything, it's like yeah. really helpful. And and that's expressly why we did it, because there were so many games that sounded great and we thought this would be amazing. And it says like two to six. They really mean four to six you yeah. know like it or or even three to six there are so many that like say two and and even sometimes they'll have like a two-player variant but it's just not quite the experience that you would have if you had many more people playing yeah. um so we, we are we are uh you know figuring out which ones are not lying about that <laughs> Right on. And Krista in the chat is saying it is epic about, will you, will you do the little camera turn that you did for me a second ago so that she can see Krista? Get ready. Sure. Because this second. shit is no joke. Look at this. Look at this. Those Girl. are books. Oh, and DVDs over there. Oh, my um, God. And, amazing. and then if you go the other way, there's the bulk of the board game collection. Um, oh, and my Diet Cokes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is my, this is my, this is our board games room slash study slash also my office because I work from home. So Krista says I own no board games. Well, Krista, <laughs> I guess you should listen to this and then you can figure out how you can play with, uh, with your cat because she doesn't, well, you have a roommate now. You would, I would have to have friends. Yeah, that was kind of us, too. We were like, well, you know, my partner and I were like, well, we know each other. So let's play two-player board games. And clearly anyone that doesn't own board games, that's because I own all of them. They're all here. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So the Phantom Toll Booth, you jumped on this because I posted in um, in a podcasting group a list of books that I had read and hadn't read. And if anybody wanted to join me, what made you want to do this one? This is this is a book that I feel like I actually evangelize about a little bit just because like I read it probably when I was maybe in fourth or fifth grade. I think it was actually a sign through school and it was just one that I loved so much and it introduced me to just like the fun that you could have with words mm. and with the meaning of words and the spelling of words just like the just the power of the English language. Um 
and probably of all languages, but this one was, you know, I read an English version. <laughs> but so it was one that just had such a profound impact on, um, like, I'm a writer. So, you know, spoiler alert, I took this very much to heart. Um, and just the, just the excitement that you could have with learning and imagination. So it was one that like, and it's, it's also a book that the people who love it really love it, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it's quite in the same territory as like super popular children's classics. Um, and the children's classics that I love the most always tend to be, I guess like maybe a little bit less well known because my other, my other huge favorite from childhood is like, the Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. And oh my I, God. I forgot <laughs> about that book. I know exactly. I love you it. You just like <laughs> blew my mind. I completely forgot about that book. Oh my God. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, please continue. <laughs> Chris is saying for you to marry her. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's delightful. Thank you. Um, so this was just like, I feel like the Phantom told with people either kind of forget about it. It's not up in the cat in the same level of, I mean, all I can think of is Harry Potter. I'm actually blanking on a lot of other like children's classics, but maybe I guess a wrinkle in time would be in there. Mm -hmm. Um, or, um, mm, I don't know, Stuart Little, what are like, yeah, Charlotte's, I that one. Charlotte's Web, things that like, most people read as a kid and I feel like Phantom Tollbooth sometimes like flies under that radar a little bit. I worked at a bookstore in college um, right as the first Harry Potter was coming out. So this is like 97, 98 and we sold out of it immediately. It wasn't like a big hit yet. Yeah. Um, but people were coming in and being like, I heard about this. I need to buy it. And I'm like, well, we ran out. But here, here's the Phantom Tollbooth. Ah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I sold it. Like I sold so many copies of the Phantom Tollbooth. And at the time I was like, um, it's way better than Harry Potter. And I hadn't read Harry Potter. So obviously I was just lying through my teeth on that one. Um, but well, it listen, was... it was the first Harry Potter. So I can forgive you because the first <laughs> one is a little bit less strong in many ways. So that's fair. Yeah. So, but, and I was like, well, you clearly want to read, you clearly want adventure. So here is the Phantom Tollbooth. Please read it. <laughs> so that's, uh, that is my experience with the Phantom Tollbooth. And it's one of those like books that I have read many, many times throughout my life. Like, it's just one that I can always like drop back into and be like, ah, here are my friends in Dictionopolis. <laughs> oh, I love that feeling. This is, and it's interesting that you say that because uh, when I, in the, um, in the podcasting group where I posed this question, if anybody wanted to join me on various ones, I feel like the Phantom Toll Booth was the one that most people were like, me, 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 but you had already said, but it got like immediately like seven below you. And I was like, sorry, Aaron. I noticed it. that. I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you had mentioned Charlotte's Web, which we did a couple months ago, um, which I did with Rachel <laughs> Rosing. And, uh, it's just, the, that's why I decided to do because I had the unspoiled book club monthly with just books that people chose over um, in like December of the previous year. And then I'd have a whole list for the year, but I realized that there are so many children's books that I never got around to reading for whatever reason that most people have read. And this was one that I had like heard the name, but I had no idea what it was about. Yeah. Um, and Charlotte's Web was another one that I had never read that everybody was. And the next month is going to be Bridge to Terabithia. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> there's, that. there's a lot that I haven't, you know, that I feel like are a part of people's childhood experiences. Um, and I've never like dipped a toe in them. So this, mm -hmm. okay, let's back it up and talk about Phantom Toll Booth here for a <laughs> second. This book, this is one of those instances where I start to read and as you get a little further into the story, I start to feel really sad because I'm realizing how my brain does not work this way anymore. And I have to adjust the whole way that I'm coming at reading this because I'm old <laughs> and have no fun, I guess Aww. a lot of the time, which is not fair at all. Like, but you know how that is? Like when you're a kid, your brain is just so much more flexible and the things that you will say and think 
and the ideas that you will take for granted or just throw out there with no thought about, is that possible? Is that a thing? Is so wide open and expansive. And I had such a hard time at first with the whole concept of what was happening when he first starts driving and runs across the weather man. <laughs> and I was just like, wait, but what? I don't get it. Like I had this moment of, and then I started to be like, okay, you know what? This is just going to be not, I don't think I had any specific expectations, but whatever small, like whatever vestigial expectations I had, I just sort of had to <laughs> throw out the window and be like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm just going to get into it. Um, and I really like, there are a lot of moments in this where, the, <laughs> for example, one of the first things that I, that you notice is like the first line, which is once there was a boy named Milo who did not know what to do with himself, not just sometimes, but always, which damn, that is a lot for the first <laughs> sentence of a children's book. Especially my, featuring a child too. That right. Like, you know, like a child, like a child who's like, yeah, I, do, I, I literally don't know. I, I don't know. And, and you don't think of children as, as knowing that they don't know what to do with themselves or thinking or thinking that they should do something with themselves. Um, but probably a lot of kids feel like that. I, you know, like it, it was a very like sort of, so when I was a child, I was basically reading the Phantom Tollbooth at the same time that I was reading Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And, and Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions and Welcome to the Monkey House. So like these, th those sorts of things were on the side. So I guess it was nice reading a children's book with another kid who was unstuck in time. You know, or just like who just didn't understand who was just like, I don't I don't feel like I belong anywhere. So it was, it was you know, heartening to read a children's book that was like, I see you there. I get yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite line in this first like whole chapter. Um, Worst of all, he continued sadly, there's nothing for me to do. Nowhere I'd care to go and hardly anything worth seeing. He punctuated this last thought with such a deep sigh that a house sparrow singing nearby stopped and rushed home to be with his family. <laughs> That's my favorite thing in the whole world. It's so dramatic. <laughs> this fucking bird is just like, okay, you know what, buddy? <laughs> I just bummed out nature. Like, right? <laughs> that's how, that's how, like, you know, deep Milo's ennui is. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so what starts off his adventure is that there is some force out there that is aware that he does not know what to do with himself and has decided that it's going to fix that <laughs> and sends him a box with a toll booth that he can assemble which i didn't expect i thought it would just like you know be be somewhere so it arriving ikea style in his room was <laughs> totally unexpected and then he has like a toy car that he gets into and he thinks that he's just playing a game where he's playing at driving up to a toll booth and is sort of like I don't know how much fun this can really be, but I guess, which <laughs> I don't have I anything else fair. to play. <laughs> right. Like if somebody was like, I bought you a, a play toll booth as a kid, would you just be kind of like, I guess, <laughs> I guess as an adult, like I kind of now forget how to do that. Like whenever like kids are like, Oh, I'm playing with so-and-so at recess. I'm like, what are you doing? Cause mm -hmm. when I get together with friends, we just sit around and bitch. So <laughs> like, I'm like, is that what you were doing? <laughs> like, are you just complain? <laughs> are you complaining? <laughs> oh my God. That's, so that's true, my though. free time. <laughs> um, and so, and, and so like, I just picture him getting into his car and like imagining that this is going to be a game of pretend. And it's delightful mm -hmm. too, that he's still like that, you know, he has that capacity of like, I'm going to pretend I'm driving up to a toll booth and like paying with my tokens or you know. surprise. <laughs> um, so yeah, he just starts to drive and all of a sudden he realizes that he is not in his room and there is a 
map in the car and he can choose where he wants to go. And he, the first place that he winds up is the land of expectations. Mm-hmm. And help me out here because a lot of the wordplay and a lot of like the, the methods of um, like speech patterns and whatnot, I understand. Why does the weatherman repeat things? Is that anything? Or is that just me trying to like put meaning on something that doesn't necessarily have meaning? I've never really viewed that as, um, you know, meaning anything except for leading into the notion of weather, weather, like homophones in general, like weather, weather and, and things like that. Like, you know, if you were going to say two words that sounded alike, then you would, it would sound like you were seeing the same thing twice. Right. So I like, I, I feel like that's mirroring like what, you know, his whole deal is of weather slash weather man because um, he's just like at first just repeats himself it's my mm-hmm. my 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 welcome 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 to the land of expectations to the land of expectations to the land of expectations we don't get many travelers these days we certainly don't get many travelers these days i was just like th- and this again was my first like intro to this new world so as a, like a, an adult reader i'm like what's happening <laughs> <laughs> what is this? And, it, um, and and you get as a reader, you get thrust into that as immediately as um, um, as Milo does. So that mm-hmm. the you know the action of the the novel is is feeling the same as for the reader. Right. Yeah, that's true. Actually, <laughs> just as <laughs> bewildered. <laughs> And he asks Milo, like, so what's your reason for going here? And Milo's like, well, I don't, like, have, do I need one? And he finally says, well, you know what? I think I have an old one you can use. (laughs) And starts looking through this, like, drawer, I guess, and pulls out a medallion that just has the words, why not engraved on it? <laughs> That's the best reason for anything. Why not? <laughs> Is that awesome? Like that has to be an actual piece of jewelry that you can buy, right? Oh, it must be. It must be in my head. I was like, someone has laser cut that onto a piece of wood at mm-hmm. some point. You can, you can, there's no way you can't find that on it, on Etsy, you know, in this, it's, in this day. And age. It's a pretty good thing. Like it's a pretty good way to live your life. Just asking yourself that. And like, as long as it's not going to hurt yourself or someone, then just be like, all right, you know, Yeah, why not? And it's fun to think of reasons um, as tan as a tangible thing too. Like I always feel like, you know, the land of expectations is set up as like, well, you have to get here before you can get anywhere else. You have to set expectations. And even if you don't go beyond this at all, at least this is where you start out. Um, So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to think of like, okay, expectations. That's where I'm going to pick up my reason, like my, <laughs> my purpose in life, which hopefully it can get one of those on Etsy too. I know, but- right? <laughs> I really, oh, I really wonder what pops up if you go on Etsy and you just search like meaning of life. <laughs> it's probably some terrible quotes about live, laugh, love. Yeah, probably my, may, hopefully some Monty Python too. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's better. Okay. That's um, acceptable. So he gets, <laughs> uh, he finally gets to um, the word market. And there are five gentlemen who travel together and talk at the same, like they each speak after the other using synonyms of what the other just said. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, it would certainly make more sense if you use just one word. Nonsense. Ridiculous. Fantastic. <laughs> absurd. Bosh. They chorused again. <laughs> We're not interested in making sense. It's not our job, scolded the first, which is my favorite. <laughs> Besides, explain the second, one word is as good as another, so why not use them all? Then you don't have to choose which one is right, advised the third. Besides, sighed the fourth, if one is right, then ten are ten times as right. <laughs> point <laughs> set so, and match <laughs> right so this is where like with the with the weatherman i was still kind of like i don't mm. and then we get to these guys and i'm like all right no you know what i get it now this is fun 
And, and, and I do wonder, like, as an adult, if you come to the, um, if you come to this story as an adult, if that comes off, because it is, you know, aggressively whimsical in places, and, or if that comes off as, this is fun, this is, you know, enjoyable, or if it's like, this book is an internet argument. And... <laughs> Oh God! No, I didn't have that. Thank God. <laughs> I and I and I'm always very leery of like, okay, like this. This is the book is illustrating that whole like nice little like that valley between logic and and whimsy, mm-hmm. and, which you know is a nice nice place to live. And if you're dying on either hill, um, sometimes it's <laughs> sometimes it's a little much. So I guess I I worried that the book would feel like a little much. Um, There was a point that we'll get to where I feel aggressively whimsical is an excellent way to put it. Um, (laughs) But that's further on and involves the demons. Oh, yeah. That's pretty, that's really the the spot that I had a hard time where I was like, all right, dude, you know what? You need to calm down. Um, (laughs) Just settle on down, Norton Justice. A little bit, a little (laughs) bit. It wasn't terrible, but it was, it was like the kind of thing that I like to think that even as a child reading it, I would have been like, all right, I get it. You don't need to (laughs) so hard, but (laughs) Um, so we find we get our first like view of what the marketplace is really like and the descriptions of it. It's just, you know, we had the first look at concepts as a tangible object with the reasons, but here we really get like that. That was not a one-off. That's how this whole universe is going to work. <laughs> um, huge wooden wheeled carts streamed into the market square from the orchards and long caravans bound for the four corners of the kingdom made ready to leave. Sacks and boxes were piled high waiting to be delivered to the ships that sailed the sea of knowledge. And off to one side, a group of minstrels sang songs to the light of those either too young or too old to engage in trade. But above the noise and tumult of the crowd could be heard the merchants' voices loudly advertising their products. Get your fresh picked ifs, ands, or buts. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, nice ripe wheres and whens. Juicy, tempting words for sale. <laughs> and I love this concept. I love right? the idea that I could just bite into a juicy, delicious word and have it like, run down my chin and then, you know, go on for a little like sorbet of a word, like a palate cleanser kind of thing, and then get into like a really meaty, like full course. And I haven't assigned words to any of these concepts. So just like, I loved the, I'm trying I loved to the think idea. Now. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I, I loved the idea that you could gobble up language and, 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 and be nourished by it. That's a good, like, um, now that you're saying like a good meaty word, and I'm trying to think what a meaty word is. And I feel like it would be something that's sort of like intellectual because it feels like it's got a lot of possibilities behind it. But I'm drawing blanks on what that would even mean. Mm-hmm. And like one of my favorite words to say is spatula. And <laughs> I feel like spatula is like a side dish, right? It's like fries. super practical too. It's it's super practical. It's like it's good for you. It's healthy. Like it's essential. Ooh, healthy. Interesting. Yeah. So maybe it's not fries. Maybe it's, uh, oh, it can't be Brussels sprouts. It's too good for that. Something. Squash. So, all right. I can go with squash. Roasted squash with some yeah. like, you know, but still a little fun because you like, so like maybe cranberries are in it. Okay. I can dig that. I love you, Krista. <laughs> Brussels sprouts are good. I, I do like them, but let's be honest. Most people don't like them. Yeah, and, I, I, I love them too, but I don't cook them for myself because I do a bad job of it. That's exactly it. They're easy to fuck up. So <laughs> I feel like spatula is pretty stable. So right. Uh, so people are wrong all the time. It's a workhorse of a word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm picturing like elucidate as a good word ooh. for like, like maybe like a light, like that is the, that's the, the sorbet course. That's your palate cleanser. Yeah. I um, like that. Um, okay. Still not, still not there on the, on the, um, on the, 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 the entree though, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to think this over as we, as we continue on. And if I come up mm-hmm. with one by the end, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, and we have a uh, a spelling bee, which 
I the story of how this <laughs> can you spell everything? asked Milo admiringly. Just about, replied the bee, with a hint of pride in his voice. You see, <laughs> years ago, I was just an ordinary bee, minding my own business, smelling flowers all day, and occasionally picking up part-time work in people's bonnets. <laughs> then one day I realized I'd never amount to anything without an education, and being naturally adept at spelling, I decided that, and he gets cut off, <laughs> which introduces the humbug. Oh, God. <laughs> The Hubbrog is drawn so well too, like with the like he's just you know like the the the, the line the pen and ink drawings like he's all like closer together but also like big and 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 blockish. Um, the 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 that's another like I mean I'm sure we'll get to it, but the illustrations really really sell a lot of the concepts in in the Phantom Toll Booth as well. That's really there was there's one demon is it a demon later on that's got basically what like what you would say is like a D20 of faces, essentially. The, do the dodecahedron. That's the one. <laughs> and I was just like, I am so glad there's an illustration here because the way it was described, I couldn't figure out what the hell he was trying to say. And then I turned the page and I'm like, oh, okay, now I get it. I, <laughs> that was mystifying. Um, and I guess it was his uh, roommate at the time. Um he just he started writing this and his roommate was an illustrator and was just like, Hey, can I get in on that? And he was like, All <laughs> right, I guess. So they just like still published the original illustrations with it. Mm -hmm. And and they like and I think it couldn't do without them because they're so perfect. And there's also like uh um they're little fun little like side bits as well. I read in um one of the forwards, I think, or like a letter from Norton Jester that the um the illustrations were sort of a source of like fun banter between the two of them like um Jules Pfeffer didn't want to draw certain things um and you know he kept on drawing trying to draw the demons as riding on cats um and Norton Why? Just like, no I don't want them on cats don't draw them on cats <laughs> so it's just a fun like it's nice to know like that much like cooperation and partnership went into the creation of it as well. Now I saw somewhere that this book was made into a movie. Have you seen it? Um, no, I think it was some, maybe sometime in the seventies. And I think that it is mm, by many accounts, it's notably bad, okay. but I haven't seen it and I've never really wanted to really kind of, Actually, did maybe like Chuck Jones do it? Um, I guess it's super weird. Like, um, but I have, but I haven't seen it, so I, I don't know that I can comment on it. But it it is not well regarded. Is is my um, is my notion? Uh, but I do think it was um, Chuck Jones, one of the Bugs Bunny illustrators, so um, oh. or animators. I may be wrong about that, but oh no, uh, no Chris, 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 yeah. Chris has let me know I'm right. <laughs> So if you picture that kind of like that, like, I think that style of animation actually really does go with the story. I think maybe it was, it just doesn't come out quite right. Or it was the seventies who knows what was going on. Right. Yeah. It's interesting <laughs> because like, um, initially when I was reading this, I was like, Oh, this would be really fun to see on film. And then I was started to be like, but there's so much wordplay that I don't know would work if you don't read it. I think it probably could be done, but I it, it would be a challenge, I feel like. So the fi the fact that you're saying, or Krista said, it was a mind fuck, and you were saying <laughs> that you heard it's really weird. I'm like, I feel like it would have to be really weird in order to get across what the book is getting across. Yeah, I just don't know if they went to the right well of weird. You know what right. I mean? Like, so um, it, it, it is, I've always been curious, but it's not. I don't know how readily available it is. Um, and I've never really wanted to necessarily like, you know, tamper with my impressions. Of, I of feel the you. Book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so he meets also um, talk. Yeah. Ticks. <laughs> and is a watchdog. <laughs> Literal watchdog. Um, and he had a brother who was named Tick, but he mm -hmm. talked. 
<laughs> and oh his goodness. parents were at their wits end. What happened to his brother? Because he said his brother died or something happened to him. Oh, I'm basic. I mean, that that feels tragic for a children's book. Um, he said something about the, like that was really sad about his history with his with his brother. And I don't remember what it was now. Uh, hmm. That's going to drive me nuts because I didn't highlight that part. I tried to highlight so many things, but then you get to the point where it's like, well, I've <laughs> highlighted too much and now I can't find anything. Yeah, it is tricky. Um, well, he is hanging out with Talk when they get arrested. Mm -hmm. And I, okay, again, with things that I just like, I definitely cackled a little bit at this. <laughs> Silence, thundered the policeman, pulling himself up to full height and glaring menacingly at the terrified bug. And now, he continued, speaking to Milo, where were you on the night of July 27th? What does that have to do with it? Asked Milo. It's my birthday. That's my what, birthday. said the policeman, as he entered, forgot my birthday in his little book. <laughs> I love the description of the officer. That was uh, Officer Shrift. Oh, yes, because he's so short oh. but wide. Right, right. He's like he's described as uh, as tall as he is wide. And the illustration of him is really amazing. It just looks right. like somebody took a regular sized man and just pushed him right. until he like squashed <laughs> down. Um, sort of we, they, so they get thrown into jail for how long? A trillion years? Something like that? It's something along the, the mil, one million years dungeon sort of thing. Um, and 990, like, oh gosh. Yeah, I'm not remembering that. Yeah, either. they said um, maybe they'll take a million years off your sentence for good behavior. So yeah, I think it's right. a trillion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is where they meet Faintly macabre. Right, right. Who's <laughs> just happily knitting away in the dungeon. And, <sighs> you know, and in her, they kind of meet their, you know, the. The quest Someone master. Who, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> she's she's got like a she's got like a you know a plum bob or a um yes. you know a question mark over her head. <laughs> and she hands them um she held out a box of sugar coated question marks, periods, commas, and exclamation points. I grammar. love it. <laughs> I know the grammar is grammar is sweet. Like <laughs> you just you just gobble up that punctuation. <laughs> um so she tells them the story of Rhyme and Reason, the two princesses yes. that are banished to the castle in the air and the like falling out between Dictionopolis and Digitopolis, mm -hmm. um, which really just comes down to words are more important. Numbers are more important. No words, no numbers. And then they just kind of like <laughs> stop talking to each other. Right. And there's no, there's no one to bridge that gap anymore. Exactly. So these two um, princesses are, are locked away and everybody seems to think that if they were freed again, everything else would just return to normal because there's a lot of stuff that's messed up as they travel through the kingdom. Right. And you get the sense too, that even people like, um, like the, the, um, chaps that all use every single word all at once that stuff mm -hmm. like that would would also level out and balance out a little bit because rhyme and reason provided like a balance to the um the land that you know people weren't just willy-nilly using every single word they knew right. or th 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 there was there was there was there was more recognition that like words are great they are also something to be careful about and right. to use wisely. So that's um, that I think is part of their quest to, to find rhyme and reason as well. Yeah. So they, this, um, which, which she's a witch. <laughs> um, she's a witch. she's uh, been like pushed down here and she, I think says that she would be released if they, if these two princesses were saved also. Right. Right. Um, and 
I can't remember exactly where. Oh, okay. Um, I'm afraid there's not much a little boy and a dog can do, but never you mind. It's not so bad. I've grown quite used to it here. Um, but you must be going or else you'll waste the whole day. Oh, we're here for six million years, sighed Milo. I don't see any way to escape. Nonsense, scolded the witch. You mustn't, mustn't take Officer Shrift so seriously. He loves to put people in prison, but he doesn't care about keeping them there. Now you just press that button in the wall and be on your way. Um, oh, no, she went away. Come back. Aaron. Where'd she go? I better pause my recording. She's here. Can you see me? Krista, you can't see Aaron, can you? Something just popped me out. Let me invite you on again. Oh, it says you're on screen, though. All right, let me kick you and then invite you back on. She got sent to jail for one trillion years, indeed. Yay! I yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Thing. I don't know either. I'm just going to keep on moving my computer around in case, like, um, moving my cursor around. Um, I'm back, and it was six million years. Six million, okay. <laughs> Got you. I'm not sure what happened. But here I am, still alive, still alive, Yay. still alive casting. <laughs> um, yeah, you went a little robot there for a second, so I'm wondering if it's your service, but... Um, but that's okay. I pause and we, I will just be able to cut that part out. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just read the part where the, uh, officer Shrift does not care whether or not they are in prison for 6 million years because he just likes to put people there and I doesn't am. care about what happens after, which is amazing. No, not again. Oh, dear. I think her ISP is fucked up. That might be because like when she did you hear when she came back? Was it robot for you? I think that might be part of it. Oh, dear. I may have to do the rest of this on Skype. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you can hear me still, but if you want to switch over to Skype and we won't do it on camera anymore. Yeah, it says that she straight up doesn't have internet connection right now. I'm really sorry. I don't know what it's doing. Um, I like my internet has, has been steady throughout the whole time that um, I've been here. I'm not even sure what it's been. It's so weird. Can you hear me now? I can, but you're definitely like in and out. Do you want to switch to just doing um, Skype? Um, Do you think that would be better? And that way we won't, and we wouldn't be on camera anymore. It might ease up your uh, bandwidth usage. Maybe. I can also try to um, use a different computer that is a little bit more. I have another one right here. Um, oh, okay. Let me see if I can pop in here. Okay. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's like three computers here. One of them has got to work. <laughs> Krista, the sound of joy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here, da, 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 da. Um. I will, so I will still be attached to one computer taping and then using this other one to film. 
Okay. Uh, email me a magic link. How is our? <laughs> My also is a little all right. I'm booting her from this one, but I'm going to add her on the other one. Getting really bad feedback. Oh, hold on. I turned your sound off briefly. Okay. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Chris is narrating everything. <laughs> Okay. It's... You're good. Okay, excellent. All right, cool. All right, I'm going to start recording again. I paused that one. Doobie, doobie, doo. All right. Okay, so it turns out that they can just leave. That there's literally a button in the prison that they can just push to go. Yep. Which uh, I feel like is a real like like a mind fuck that would be kind of amazing to have in like juvie, where you just kind of mess with a kid and and try and scare him straight and throw him in juvie, and then you're like, but there's a button in there somewhere. If he finds it, he can push it and he'll just get right out. But he doesn't know it's there, so we'll see if he ever figures it out. <laughs> um. And they get on the road. Um, where, where is it? Ha, oh, right. They get brought to the banquet. Um, and like, Shrift sees them and is like, oh, hey, what's up? <laughs> oh, man, time flies. Has it been a million years already? Like, he just. <laughs> just no, no concept of time or numbers or anything like that. <laughs> nothing. Um, and. I love this so much because they offer him a rigmarole, a ragamuffin. <laughs> Perhaps you'd care for a synonym bun. Have you seen that meme? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Somebody on Twitter posted a picture of cinnamon rolls and they misspoke. They mistyped and they wrote synonym rolls and somebody <laughs> retweeted it. Just like grammar used to me. <laughs> I have never seen that, but that is delightful. <laughs> um, and it they it turns out you can like make your own dinner. So like they bring out stuff, and then you stand up and make a speech, and whatever you say you want is on your plate. <laughs> Because you have to eat your words. <laughs> I love this so much. And I feel I felt so deeply for Milo in this situation that he had no idea that's how it works. And he's asked to go first and he doesn't get any dinner. <laughs> and everybody else around him is eating these amazing meals. And he's just kind of looking on like, whoa, gee whiz, <laughs> you know, like 
Because Milo, <laughs> that's tough, buddy. Because he's like, hello, you know, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for. Now, this is a question that I do have. When they're eating their words and they mm-hmm. ordered like, you know, roast beef, mashed potatoes, pumpkin pie. I'm assuming that the words show up, but they taste like roast beef mashed potatoes and pumpkin pie or have those actual oh. this is something that's always actually been like you know a puzzle to me interesting um i'm trying to find the exact uh, the exact like spot where they place their orders <laughs> um the waiters reappeared immediately carrying heavy, hot trays, which they set on the table. Each one contained the exact words spoken by the various guests, and they all began Im- eating immediately with great gusto. So, yeah, you are correct. See? Yeah. This is the shit that I didn't pick up on the first time at all. <laughs> so, that's pretty fun. Um, all right. So... They so they eat and finally he like has a roll that he puts in his pocket to save for later that says everything happens for the best mm-hmm. um, because they all they're given a bunch of like kind of what is it half baked ideas right half baked ideas or um, uh, you know sometimes they're they they seem platitudes to be platitudes that sort of thing like you know just just sayings um. Which I really enjoy that everything happens for reasons included on there because, man, that is just one of those things that drives me bananas when right. trying, people try and pull that. Mm-mm. You can imagine that does not taste very good at all. Right, yeah. Um, so, let's see. Oh, right. So, they get on the road the next day and they <laughs> run across this kid named Alec who is standing in the middle of the air because in his world, kids are born (laughs) in midair and then grow down to meet the ground. Which which, I guess takes some of the guesswork out of growing up. Yes. You know exactly how tall you're (laughs) going to be growing down indeed. (laughs) Um, And I love that it's, like it, th- he talks about different points of view and how this bucket of water over here to certain animals would be an ocean and to others, it's just a drink and to others it's home because it's, if a fish lived in there and all of this stuff. Um, and he uh, talks about the two towns, illusions and reality mm-hmm. and that people are choosing to live in one or the other where he comes from. Um, and the, the humbug who has come along for the ride along with talk and Milo. Um, he, he asks because he's the kid. Alex says mirages are things that aren't really there that you can see very clearly. How can you see something that isn't there? Yawned the humbug who wasn't fully awake yet. Sometimes it's much simpler than seeing things that are, he said, For instance, if something is there, you can only see it with your eyes open. But if it isn't there, you can see it just as well with your eyes closed. That's why imaginary things are often easier to see than real ones. Listen. (laughs) That was a word right there. That was a lot. And I don't know if he knew how much of a lot that was. But in the current (laughs) climate, I feel like that is a thing that means more than maybe it used to or than it would to a kid. Mm Mm-hmm. Because damn, <laughs> like it's a little upsetting to be honest. Because it's true, right? Right. It's 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 maybe that's the um maybe he's more profound as a kid because he's already at the like he's already at the perspective that he'll have as an old. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I never, I didn't really think about whether like you know, your mentality goes along with growing down, but maybe it does. Mm-hmm. Um, so what had happened was that everybody who was living in this town decided that they just wanted to get from place to place as quickly as they could. And 
didn't understand that the fun of getting from one place to another was seeing what was in between. And so they just stare down at their feet because they realized that ignoring everything around them got them places faster. And they did this so determinedly that eventually the town disappeared because it wasn't even being noticed. It wasn't being appreciated. So pick, yeah, picked up and went home. Which very significantly is how Milo is described as functioning. At the beginning of the book. Right. Because they, they, they um, mentioned that like, you know, he doesn't care very much where he's going. He just wants to get there as quickly as possible. Um, and now he's faced with, you know, seeing like the consequence, what the consequences of that would be in this land. Um, and, you know, maybe they're a little bit outlandish, but, you know, to, to a kid, he can think like, oh, well, you know, I don't want everything around me to disappear. And he's also on this elaborate, confusing sort of trip where he may or may not be like, where, you know, for better, or for worse, he has to pay very close attention to everything around him because, you know, who knows if he's going to fall in a, into a bucket of water that happens to be the size of an ocean. Like, True. <laughs> depending, you know, depending on whether, you know, you're looking at the at what perspective you're looking at it from. And I like too the in the beginning when it's the when his walking place to place as quickly as he can is described, it's emphasized that it's not like he particularly wants to be anywhere. And when he gets there, he doesn't really have anything that he wants to do. He mm-hmm. just wants to get there for the sake of doing it quickly, which isn't anything. Right. <laughs> And Just that's a really interesting idea. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm rushing towards my boredom. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I'm bored, but at least I'm I'm there and doing it. Which is it, that's such like a strange concept to like wrap your mind around, but it it just rings so true. Yeah. That um you have to like appreciate wherever you happen to be for what it offers you. Um, Mm -hmm. And earlier in the book, too, he says, like, you know, when he was in school, he wanted to be home. When he was at home, he wanted to be at school. Like, you know, they're just presenting, like, craving something, some some level of action to occur. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense to want to be somewhere else if you're not appreciating or looking at what's around you. And then getting to that somewhere else and it being no more satisfying because it's you it comes down to, um, which... You know, just remind, there's like an Onion article that I saw yesterday, which was a man considering packing up and making mistakes this all over again in a new location. (laughs) Oh, don't, don't we all area man? (laughs) (laughs) Because it's so, it's something like I traveled a lot as a kid or as a young adult and I moved around a lot and it Mm. really was tempting to think that things would be different in different places. And the truth is it's just not like there, there are certainly going to be some circumstantial differences living in Texas versus Connecticut, for example. Yeah. But, but the fundamentals about what makes you happy and not usually don't have anything to do with where you are. It's about you. Right. And what, and what you're putting out into the world around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, It's the same. I've lived in the, pretty much I've lived in the same state my entire long life so and it's it's the same whether you I'm guessing it's the same because every now and then I'm like yeah I could just pick up and move to like you know Scranton the office was fun I liked watching that living in Scranton's probably just like the office oh my god I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm going to stay here. (laughs) Yeah, the only thing I could see is moving somewhere with, like, socialized medicine where I wouldn't constantly have to worry about that. That probably would have a significant impact on whether I was happy or not. I'll I'll admit that. Yeah. Um, But, okay, so so they move on from this place after kind of a, you know, a warning being intoned about... (laughs) taking things for granted and then them disappearing. And then they begin to um, pass into the Valley of Sound. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a lot happening here. Yeah. (laughs) The Silent Valley, as it turns out to be. (laughs) So they first meet, what is this doctor's name? Cacophonous? Yes. Um, What is it? Dr... 
Yeah, it's spelled. It's like some words are just spelled like as they're as they, you know, might look. But mm -hmm. professor, now it's bugging me. Um, chroma. No, it's chroma, right? Chroma is the one who does. Um, oh, he's I forgot about that. I totally he's skipped the that. He's the conductor. Yes. I forgot all about that because they get ushered away from um, the reality area and into the, uh, I can't believe I didn't highlight anything from that. <laughs> I think it's just because it was just so overwhelming that I was like, I'm going to highlight this whole thing. <laughs> um, uh, c uh, cacophonous A Discord. Who oh, is that's a right. Doctor of Dissonance, which again would be a pretty, would, would be a pretty solid uh, doom metal band. Really? That's true. <laughs> Um, and he has his uh, buddy, the Awful Din, oh. <laughs> which uh, there's layers going on there because yeah. Din is also a genie. So mm -hmm. he's like in a little itty bitty living space. <laughs> but and he's, he's, mer out. he's very merry as well. Like he. Yes. <laughs> Lots and of emotion going on. And him and the din love awful, annoying, loud sounds, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is really funny later because uh, the the woman who's in charge of the Valley of Sound later, she's like, well, here, have some of these. And the din is like, no. Oh, God, those are way too pleasant. Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> um but yeah, I can't believe that I skipped over Chroma because that was such a cool, I want to step back on that for like okay. real quick because one of my favorite things, um, one of my favorite books as a kid was The Magician's Nephew, which is the first book in the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Like the, mm -hmm. you know, it came out, it, he wrote it after Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, but in the universe, it was first. And there is a whole scene of Aslan singing the world into existence and as he sings certain types of notes stars appear and the sun rises and eventually the things that he's singing into existence also begin to sing mm -hmm. and create this symphony and create animals and um, I was just always so entranced by that idea as a kid so this whole thing with Chroma who directs the enormous symphony that plays color into the world mm -hmm. is the coolest thing <laughs> ever. Because there's that such reverence, like, oh, what are they playing? They're playing the sunset. They play it, mm -hmm. you know, every every day around this hour. And then the description of, you know, how they are playing the sunset is is just amazing as well. And in, in, yeah. in terms of how it's described sound, it's written exactly like a sunset looks. And that's always, uh, that's, a, you know, like anything that adds to uh, creating that picture in a, in my head for, especially as a kid reading this book was um, uh, very, very moving. Yeah, it reminded me of um, like the opening of Fantasia where they're still doing the really impressionistic illustrations of what instruments sound like. Mm -hmm. um, because as that movie continues, you start to get like very distinctive imagery. But at the beginning, it's just sort of or, of um, bursts of color and light. And that's how a lot of the different instruments are described in terms of a specific color. Um, and it's just such a cool, like the just conceptually. And I love that, that Milo has the hubris to just be like, Oh, you know what? I'll let him sleep and I'll just bring the sun up. Yo dude. <laughs> and he managed just to get it. Cause I was a little bit worried as I was reading this, that he was going to cause some like damage that would just, right. <laughs> you know, be irreparable. Mm -hmm. But uh, luckily it's a temporary thing. And he's able to call Chroma and just be like, um, no, the sun's up and he, <laughs> nobody's aware except for like a couple people that the sun rose and set and rose and set and rose and set and rose and set like <laughs> seven times in three so, minutes. So you all rip Van Winkled yourselves through like a week or so. Yeah. <laughs> Just crazy. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing up Chroma and I cannot believe I forgot that. <laughs> um, all right. So he, after he meets um, the professor 
he continues on into the valley where nobody is speaking and there is no sound of anything. There's no, you know, sound of the cart that they're in or birds or anything. And there are people protesting sound for all. Uh, it's laudable <laughs> to be audible. Like all of yeah. these amazing signs. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And and sound has been, you know, ta well, and in, in particular, one of their banners, the here, here continues the <laughs> yes. <laughs> one of these words sounds like another. <laughs> exactly. Um, so they tell Milo that he needs to sneak into to the sound keepers fortress mm -hmm. and steal a sound and bring it out and they'll load the sound into the cannon. And if they can just have that one sound, it'll knock down everything and all the other sounds will come out and right. they'll have sound back. <laughs> so he goes in there and um, the sound keeper has it so that you can talk in here in the fortress. So they're <laughs> able to have a regular conversation. She's very stingy. She turns out. <laughs> and I love that she's but for whatever reason I still like really love her like I like I think even as a child I was like I'd like to be you know like an an older lady sitting up in my castle just enjoying my radio program of silence <laughs> like, <laughs> like totally and if there isn't that on NPR yet it's probably a common like oh you know? probably <laughs> I guess so, they have apps and stuff that probably like, you know, mindfulness and meditation apps that are probably just like aggressive silence. Right. Intentional silence. Yes. <laughs> Purposeful, you know, quiet. Oh, that's exactly how they'd word it too. <laughs> that's some goop shit right there. I know. I, hear, I feel bad that it came out of my mouth at all. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that she said when they broke up? It was like, oh, 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 oh conscious, conscious uncoupling. uncoupling. Yes. <laughs> I kind of love that, like, all of us were like, yep, that's what it was. Conscious uncoupling. <sighs> that and, is unforgettable. Yeah, it's there forever. It's there forever. I, yeah, gosh. <laughs> oh, Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> so, so Milo goes in there and she shows him the, um, the store's of sounds that are like way under the building. He has to go downstairs or is it an elevator? I think yeah. um, <laughs> the sound mines or, or vaults or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and she's saying um, if we didn't collect them, the air would be full of old sounds and noises bouncing around and bumping into things. It would be terribly confusing because you'd never know whether you were listening to an old one or a new one. Mm -hmm. um, and she pulls out an envelope and says, this is the exact tune George Washington whistled when he crossed the Delaware on that icy night in 1777. Milo peered into the envelope and sure enough, that's exactly what was in it. No explanation. It just says that that's what's in there. Exactly. And he immediately recognizes it. <laughs> I love I his sound archives. <laughs> I'm dying. Like, when she opens it, can he hear it? Can't. I would think so. Yeah. Like, or he must he just, be. He, it says he looks inside, and that's what. So, like, we're know, back to the food. Yeah, we're back to the food question. Like, yes, you know, some I, I think, you know, sometimes the book benefits from a suspension of disbelief when you're just kind of like, uh huh. Mm -hmm. sure, yeah, sure. That's exactly what it is. And like and Milo doesn't question it, I think, because like the intention is that the, the you know, the the book is so definite in it's like this is what it is mm -hmm. and there's no way to argue with it because everything is just so logical literal but also reasonable in a lot of ways and it's like yep, there it is that this is what i mean sense. when i say how much i'm sad that i've grown up and like this concept would never even occur to my brain if i was writing a children's story and somebody was like Okay, so uh, there's got to be some place where they store sounds. And I'll, I would be like, yes, they're all on cassettes. Let's go old school. <laughs> like, I do something like that. But just, like, in envelopes and you look in there and you see. It's not even that you open the envelope and you hear it. That 
my brain just doesn't do that kind of thing anymore. And it's tragic. <laughs> I don't think mine does either. It's it's this like it's this sort of nonlinear thinking mm -hmm. but at the same time it makes like perfect perfect sense like yeah you know every now and then I'll definitely like try to be an imaginative like usually typically like if I'm like you know engaging with my younger nieces or something one of them had a backpack a new backpack that had like a galaxy print and a unicorn and I was like well Haley you're all set you're gonna like Oh, and it says like get it says like get ready world or something like that on it. I'm like you're gonna run on in the, into kindergarten and be like, I'm ready world. Look at me now. And you know I embellished a little bit, and she looked at me and she's just like, it's just a backpack. Let's not get crazy. And I'm like, okay. Oh, no, you are too <laughs> damn. You are too young to be jaded. And I'm like, wait, wait are children not as imaginative now? I don't know. I feel like. You, I should give her phantom toll booth and then it'll just mm. expand you know her what? mind immediately. <laughs> I approve this message. <laughs> give all of your children everywhere. Phantom toll booth. And that's like, cause I, I've, I've used this example before when I was a, a kid, I was filling, I was coloring in a coloring book that had a picture of a butterfly and I colored each of the wings completely differently. And my uncle at the time was like, why didn't you color them both the same? And I looked at him like with such disdain and was just like, cause that would be boring. <laughs> and like, you know, like nowadays would it even occur to me to do them differently? No. But as a kid, <laughs> it didn't occur to me to do them the same because why would you fucking do that? It's and your butterfly, you know, right. you, you do whatever you want. I think so, I would uh, color them differently now. Um, I have to say I'm not a super, like I find coloring to be a lot of pressure um particularly like the adult coloring books that have come out like there are like very very tiny like I could probably do a children's coloring book and feel less pressured but like one coloring page would take me forever yep. to color everything and I do feel obligated to color everything like differently but complementary colors you know like I, I like there to be some like rhythm you know rhyme and reason to my coloring and there's just a lot of pressure to do it right like I, even though it's it supposed to be happy to hear you say pressure. that <laughs> yeah because those are always like touted as like oh this is so relaxing and i'm like For it's fucking not who? at all it's not you know what sitting and staring at you know my phone is relaxing like <laughs> yeah you know like i just play bejeweled for like an, a half hour and just kind of disconnect my brain and just connect colors that's fine but that's like, <laughs> I'm just such a perfectionist that something that I could make mistakes or do so. And I, it's not like you can undo it, you know? Yeah, right, no. right. Once colored, uh, it, once it's colored, like you can't do anything. I am actually, I feel, I feel actually less pressure from crocheting or knitting because that like, I can just frog that back out. Like, yep. Yeah, I see it, that. The, the beauty is in the impermanence. Yep. Oh, that's a good idea. Online coloring. And it probably yeah. lets, it probably lets you color in an entire like you just tap it lock all at once and be like mm -hmm. this is pink now it's not yeah I, like I that think idea. that because I've seen those apps and I think that you can choose to either like color it with your finger as if it were or you can tap it and it fills in the whole thing mm -hmm. um, so yeah I could see that mm. um, my my fourth computer has a pen and I could definitely you know <laughs> girl. <laughs> you need to chill out. <laughs> my I'm gonna get computer. On a, I'm gonna get on a third one. <laughs> oh my god. Um, and then and then the last the last one that I will use to just be like how with with thinking in this fashion. But I've never seen a sound. Milo insisted. You've never seen them out there, she said, waving her arm in the general direction of everywhere, except once in a while on a very cold morning when they freeze. But in here, we see them all the time. So he claps his hands and all of these like crisp white sheets of paper just fly out of the air. Um, just all of these different things that create actual objects. And it's just the coolest idea. I just love it. I love it. Right. I love it. <laughs> that does seem like, like what clapping would sound like. Um, so 
he goes out there and what what he manages because she's like got her eye on him when he's in the right. archives and is not about to let him leave with anything. And when he's in the uh, parlor with her, he starts to say, but, and stops himself. And <laughs> that act of stopping from saying it catches the word in his mouth. And he goes outside and just spits the <laughs> word into the cannon. <laughs> and they just use the word, but to <laughs> knock down the entire fortress and get all of the sound out. And it's kind of amazing because she's like laying in the rubble, like sitting there, like really sort of despondent, but at the same time is like, yeah, it's probably for the best, but <sighs> I had I it really well collect. organized. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> you can imagine like the plight of like, li- like librarians everywhere when, you know, people do put books back on the shelf, even though they're told not to. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of those things that I um, only recently started to understand how that worked. Like I always thought, always thought I was being so helpful. And uh, <laughs> th- don't they like, according to how many books have to be taken and put back on the shelf, that's like how they determine how many books are being browsed and how, like there's another aspect of it besides putting them back in the wrong spot. But when oh, they put them know. back, they like scan was- them. I um, always just thought it was just putting them on the, the in the wrong spot and like not such that like, you know, the, the, the library system or whatever is saying like that's this this book is here in the library and it is because it hasn't been taken out. But, you know, it's like a Hannah Arendt book sitting in the knitting section. Right. And, um, you know, so I th- that that was the only aspect. And I'm taking that almost purely from the 1996 Parker Posey movie, Party Girl. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to have to look into that because I remember seeing that somewhere that, like, if you put it on one of the carts on the side, instead of putting it back, they scan all of the books that are on the cart before returning them to the shelves. So it sort of keeps a record of how many books are, are browsed. And that gives an indication of how many people are in and out of the library and how used the library is as a whole. Oh, okay. That is valuable. Like, you know, the gauging level of interest. Yeah. But somebody who's listening to this is going to correct me on that. So bring (laughs) it on, I say. (laughs) Um, all right. So where's our next stop? Um, I oh, think we're going to jump to conclusions. That's right. <laughs> Which is okay. Um, I love it so much. I love that. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening as it happens because they each get lifted right out of the car. As they're just like, you know, saying things like, I'm sure we're going to get there soon. It's going to be a lovely day. Like, really simple, you know. And then, whoosh. And they arrive on this island, and there are so many people on the island. <laughs> that they've just jumped to those conclusions and they can't get back. Like, yep. you know, they've, and I'm a big fan of this because at least a good portion of my physical exercise is jumping to conclusions. <laughs> so I like, I've always been, I've always been very, very excited by, by this particular concept. <laughs> That's true. Like, um, that, to jump to conclusions, Matt, is all I could think of from my uh, office space. Have you seen that? Well, this yes, guy is like, years. <laughs> he thinks this is going to be his retirement plan that this amazing jump to conclusions, Matt. You close your eyes and oh. then just jump to a conclusion. <laughs> and people are like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, and the, there's this whole thing with a guy named Canby. I'm not going to get into that. There goes a joke that I was just like. Yeah, that even as a, when I read that, I was like, I don't, this doesn't seem like a conclusion that Milo could have made even while standing on the island of conclusions. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Like, because he's fast as can be, slow as can be. 
Smart as can I, I be, stupid as can be. Yeah, right. I could. I wouldn't get your name out of that, and I don't think Milo could either. Like he's he's shown some ingenuity throughout this trip, but like that this is the one. That's that's the encounter that kind of, um, you know, just rings less true to me. Yeah, I feel like I I wasn't really sure what the point of it was either because I expected that if they like got this puzzle right that they would be sent back to where they had been or something like but but can be just moves on to the next crowd and presents the same question to them and there's no apparent like payoff for it mm-hmm. um and they wind up having to like swim from the island to get back which seems super unfair like <laughs> that is harsh and there's no boat come on help us out here um but I mean, I, like I guess the I've idea always, of it. yeah, I guess I always read that as like there can be some serious consequences if you jump to conclusions, mm-hmm. and they are generally not swimming through icy water, but in this in this world, they apparently are. <laughs> yeah, he says you can never jump away from conclusions, which I'm like, well, yeah. you have a point there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's why we're so terribly crowded here. <laughs> is there even a boat? Oh no! The only way back is to swim, and that's a very long and a very hard way. So <laughs> yeah, they uh, wind up dealing with it and heading out anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they get to three different roads um, once they get back to the car, and they meet the dodecahedron, mm-hmm. who <laughs> presents them with. A million math problems that somehow Milo can actually solve. Right. And I think the book is letting us know that he is actually a smart kid Mm -hmm. and this is all doable math. And, you know, it's really if he just applies himself, he's going to be fine. Um, uh, My eyes glaze over a little bit during the latter half of the book because, you know, whatever faintly macabre and the princess's rhyme and reason say, I'm always going to pick words over numbers. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I do like respect when he when they finally like reach Digitopolis and he says something about how like, well, numbers are the same everywhere, no matter what language a seven is a seven. And I I do get that and see the value in it and I understand that, but my brain doesn't operate that way as easily. I can do it, but it really takes a readjustment of my entire like right. being <laughs> basically. I have a very, very legitimate reason like why I just why my brain also trips over math. And it's because in second grade I was um sent to the third grade class for reading. Um, And so I missed a good half of my second grade math class. So I missed those, Uh. I missed those foundational things. So the aforementioned niece who was not as impressed by her backpack, she's in kindergarten and she um, was tested for her reading level. And the book, the, the school ran out of her classroom, ran out of books to figure out which level she was. So they just quit at like fifth grade level. Um, So they're supposed to be skipping her into the second grade classroom out of kindergarten for reading. And I said to my sister, well, do not let them skip her out of her math class because she needs those foundational things because Mm -hmm. it just, it just, you know, if you don't get them in those early years, it just never, it never clicks. That's an interesting because like, my experience with math in the sixth grade, I was like top of my class um, with algebra. And in the seventh grade, um, there were two divisions and one of them was higher level and one was lower level. And they put me in the lower level class for like, and it was above across the board, every subject, lower level. And I excelled in every subject, but math, but they decided to push me up to the next one just hoping that I would catch up Mm -hmm. and I couldn't, I was, I was excelling in everything, but the math class, it was really, I mean, when you miss the first two months of algebra two or geometry, maybe it was, that's, that's a lot to just try and catch up on, on your own as a kid, you know? Yeah. Switching from geometry to from geometry 
uh, to geometry from algebra as well mm-hmm. is also really tricky. It's totally different way. Like geometry is a much more visual math mm-hmm. um, in my mind. And, um, and that may be wrong because it's in my mind. Um, but it's very much like, it just feels totally different because I was in the same position. Like I was great in algebra one and then geometry, I was okay. And then algebra two, like I bumped up to like the honors level and it was just like, Nope, I can't do that at all. I am a, I'm a standard math student. (laughs) Yeah. It's uh, I feel like there was also, I had a really great teacher in sixth grade who knew exactly how to explain things to somebody who thinks the way that I think, so that it made sense. And then when I went to other classes, the teachers just didn't have the gift to think differently about how to explain something. And right. if you didn't get it with the way that they explained it the first time, you just weren't really going to get it. So, yeah, it's not like I dislike math. I just feel like math takes extra care and I'm not willing to expend the energy usually. Right. <laughs> math math needs greater care and feeding. <laughs> yes. Right. Um. Yeah, and I'm just going to read this because so that you guys get the the overall impression when you said that your eyes glazed over in this part a little bit, like, amen, because let, listen to this, folks. <laughs> if a small car carrying three people at 30 miles an hour for 10 minutes along a road five miles longer at 1135 in the morning starts at the same time as three people who have been traveling in a little automobile at 20 miles an hour for 15 minutes on another road exactly twice as long as one half the distance of the other, while a dog, a bug, and a boy travel an equal distance in the same time or the same distance in an equal time along a third road in mid-October, then which one arrives first and which is the best way to go? <sighs> 17 <laughs> <laughs> it's just and i i love that like he's you know throwing in things like mid-october to just like confuse right. the issue you know that is what it feels like to take standardized tests too because they that just was- decide to fuck with you yeah. And like I had, fr- I had, um, uh, one of my best friends would do logic problems for like logic puzzles for fun. And I try to do them. It'd be like, well, Susan is sitting next to Mary at this dinner and who's wearing a green hat and who's wearing blue shoes. And I, you know, I would read this and I'd be like, well, Susan isn't wearing a blue hat and green shoes. Cause those don't go together. Like, <laughs> Oh my God, that's amazing. Uh, Susan, sweetie, we need to talk about this that you're doing right now. And I feel oh. bad that I used to exist because Susan was my best friend that that loved to do logic problems and logic problems have served her well in life. And I'm very pleased. She was so good at them. And I was just always like, I'm going to call her in the dots. <laughs> This oh, one God. doesn't have a dot in it. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that so much. Um, so it turns out, long story short, all of the three uh, roads get there in the exact same amount of time. So it does not matter. Um, <laughs> and I, okay, then... Um, they when they pull when they get there he's talking about like the mines and that you have to dig for them the numbers um mm-hmm. don't you know anything at all about numbers well i don't think they're very important snap milo too <laughs> embarrassed to admit the truth <laughs> not important roared the decahedron turning red with fury could you have tea for two without the two or three blind mice without the three? Would there be four corners of the earth if there weren't a four? And how would you even sail the seven seas without a seven? If you had high <laughs> hopes, how would you know how high they were? And did you know, and if you, did you know that narrow escapes come in all different widths? Would you travel the whole wide world without knowing how wide it was? And how could you do anything at long last without knowing how long the last was? <laughs> the dodecahedron is apoplectic oh my god he's so mad (laughs) this is how i react when krista tells me that for dinner she had a bag of bread because krista (laughs) doesn't cook and she will literally just eat a loaf of bread for dinner and this is my Mm. reaction when she tells me that guess what's on my (laughs) desk right now natasha krista you need to stop agitating me while i'm on my show okay because you know how i react to this this isn't fair not fair play (laughs) Um, I can't eat any bread, so. Oh, no. I'm sorry. 
I <laughs> got the celiac. No. <laughs> uh, I, I guess there's like a lot more out there now. And there's some decent like bl- bread replacements, but it's still, are, it's, yeah. it's so, you got to be so careful if it's celiac. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So they're mining numbers, which mm-hmm. is the coolest. It definitely made me think of Bitcoin a little bit. I won't lie. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> This is like a precursor to cryptocurrency, right? <laughs> and so, and and everything in this, uh, in the Phantom Toll Booth, is very like artfully and cryptically um, discussed. So, <laughs> adding <Boo. in. laughs> Well, I I really like that the the numbers as they're mining the numbers, they they you know they're just dis- they're described as numbers, but also as jewels, mm-hmm. and I like that they like you know, have them as that, you know, have numbers with that, you know, value or like perceived value as as gemstones, that they are something that you would look at and be like, this is really important. Like this is, this is uh, significant and valuable. And they're all different sizes and different colors. Like it's just so, such a cool idea. And I love that there's like also just piles of gemstones that they're going to literally throw in the trash because (laughs) who cares? Right, right. Because, you know, if you didn't have numbers, you, the, how would you know how much those rubies and and uh, sapphires are worth? Heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, I wanted Milo to take one so bad and for him to just be like, if you're just going to throw it out, can I just like take one home? And then he'd be set for life. <laughs> I know. In a Goonies sort of situation. Right. Like, oh, I took exactly. out my marble and <laughs> put some numbers in. Um. So and yeah, uh, he he's like looking at one of the numbers too, and he drops it and it breaks in two. Oh, don't mm-hmm. worry about that," said the mathematician as he scooped up the pieces. We use the broken ones for fractions. <laughs> <laughs> I just love like I'm I I don't imagine that in the writing of the book this was like as effortless as it seems, but it really just like everything just flows so nicely. Of course the broken ones are fractured. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like it's, it just, everything is just fits so well. Except for uh, candy. As, as we've yes. discussed. <laughs> um, and so they finally, they get invited to dinner and they eat all of this stew and they wind up way hungrier in the end than they were to start off with. And it, out that they were eating some sub- subtraction stew. So every right. time they ate, it was like <laughs> negative food. <laughs> They're eventually going to just lead to famine. Right. And I'm really curious because like they're saying like, well, you know, you wait until you're full again and then you you eat so that you can. And I'm like, but how do you get full again? How does that work? It's never explained. It's just sort of treated like you just gradually refill as I guess. the day goes you, on. Yeah. Do you eat like, I don't know, like multiplication porridge or something? Like if you just like. want a quick snack or like the subtraction. And which is the desirable state? Like, do you want to be full or do you want to be famished? I don't like one. One would assume not famished. But one would think, yeah. <laughs> um, in but a few it, hours, you'll be nice and full again, just in time for dinner. And I'm just like, but how? <laughs> People don't just make after their own food, like internally. That's not how this works. <laughs> um, you know, what are the three laws of transfiguration? Right? Yes, see? <laughs> We're speaking the language that I understand. <laughs> I thought that might help. <laughs> Um, so then comes the conversation where they're trying to convince him that he needs to cooperate with, with the, uh, king of Dictionopolis. Yeah. Dictionopolis. Digitopolis needs to cooperate with, with Digitopolis. So it's Azaz, who's the king of Dictionopolis. And this is the math magician who's the king of, um, Digitopolis. Right. Um, so he says, like, he basically is like, well, we'll never agree on anything. <clears throat> and Milo's like, yeah, he says you'll never agree on anything either. But if you bon- both agree that you don't agree on anything, 
doesn't that mean that you agree on something? <laughs> it's like, God damn it. <laughs> it's well, so, shit. Right? <laughs> like now that they need to, that, that because he's been tricked, that they're going to, now they're, they have to cooperate. Well, if there's one thing about this land that, that seems to be a constant is that like, no one can argue with logic. That's true. You know, even, even if the logic itself goes too far and is beyond what actual, actual logic would be because rhyme and reason are gone, they, you have to agree. You can't like, when presented with a problem that has no particular solution or has only one solution, um, then then they have to agree. The 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 lo- the the book is internally consistent in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. That's a good point. <laughs> um, so he gives him a, a pencil as a magic wand to take with him along with the uh the sounds of laughter and cheering and the words um mm-hmm. and milo heads on into the mountains of ignorance for a chapter 17 <laughs> the welcoming committee i'm not gonna get too hard into this <laughs> okay because you weren't super into the demons the first one trivium i really liked with him being, being like, I need you to just like move these grains of sand, but I only have tweezers. <laughs> and like, and, and then he's so like, dapper about it too. Right? He's like. There's something he's, about the, the fact that he's not only dapper, but also just standing there and, and letting them get on with it mm-hmm. and not contributing at all. <laughs> it feels really like middle management and true. Like, right. There's a lot going on there is what I'm saying. So <laughs> as, as a grown up, that spoke to me in a very right. kind of way. It's this very like it's this well-dressed malevolence mm-hmm. like this, you know, the, this um, Billy Bulger, who was a um, politician in Massachusetts, once called uh, once accused me of unsleeping malevolence um, and. It, it so and I and I always liked that it was like you know, constant, constant wow. and dedicated. He didn't like journalists. <laughs> Unsleeping malevolence. Wow, <laughs> that's good stuff. Uh, I've always aspired to. <laughs> um. So they have like the, after that the demon of insincerity. Um. Then they, there's a giant that is uh afraid of everything that is so ferocious because if others found out it would just die <laughs> that is pretty fun and I'm, I'm like down with all of this until we have like the long description of all of the different demons and then it started to go over too hard for me um, because, you know, we get like, well, these demons looked like each other, but looked totally different. Or one looked exactly like the other two, which those two look totally different. Um, <laughs> and there's all of these like sort of foibles and, and, uh, pitfalls and bad habits that are like given bodies and are following them. Um, right. And it's just, I'm trying to find the exact spot where this starts because they, they're like chasing them at one point before they get to the, um, the castle, but I can't Mm -hmm. find it. It's right past it. I guess I didn't highlight it. Um, but yeah, it was just a little heavy on the, like the, um, the symbolism, like, whereas I felt everything before had very clever wordplay. This was just outright, like metaphor, that was right. much less like fun and playful and, and um, let you figure it out as you read it. I it feel wasn't like, as heavy handed as this. Yeah. I feel like the, uh, the first three where you like meet them and, and are in the situation and are figuring out what this demon is for that it could have been fine with just that. And he didn't need to get into all of the other 
types of demons that appeared. You know what I mean? Right. And they all basically seem to be like, they're not exactly demons. They're kind of personal demons mm-hmm. um, for <laughs> that, that still feel, you know, all of the, the that still feel very real now the whole you know there's there's at least one who's like oh i'm whatever i'm whatever i'm near i have no shape of my own so i just try to be like whatever i'm near mm-hmm. and you know, the, the, if the book has been doing anything it has been encouraging you to the reader to maintain like your own self sense of self and your own you know internal logic throughout yeah that's that's exactly true yeah. Um, so they go up into the castle in the air. They have to get past the sense taker who uh, seems like a census taker initially, mm-hmm. but then it turns out that he literally takes their senses away so that they like can't smell or see or hear anything that he hasn't put in their head that is not actually real and distracts them from their duty until they like kind of get snapped out of it because my uh, Milo drops his bag with the sounds in it, which wake them up out of everything. Right. Um, And they manage to get up into this castle to the princesses. And they're like in there chatting with these very chill princesses. When the demons like knock down the stairway to get to the castle, Mm -hmm. they're a little bit over aggressive. Um. (laughs) They do not care for the idea of these princesses returning to their lands, I guess. <laughs> but the princesses are not worried about it because they know that there are going to be people coming for them. They're like, they're just so, they're just so chill. They are. They are. They're very like, they, they are rhyme and reason together. They're just relaxed. And again, much like the sound keeper, I would totally be on board with hanging out with, with rhyme and reason, right? Just sitting in their castle and chit chatting or talking or not talking. They, no the drama. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You oh, don't have I, to use every single word. <laughs> I just found this because I thought that the demons were chasing them before they got to the castle, but the, they're like climbing the staircase as the, so we have gross exaggeration. The demon, mm-hmm. has just said, we have a threadbare excuse. Oh, God. I love I love the description of threadbare excuse. <laughs> Overbearing know it all, the mm-hmm. gorgons of hate and malice, horrible hopping hindsight, and yeah, I think I think um, threadbare excuse is the last one that's described, and then it's just like basically tons more <laughs> silhouettes are coming after them, right? And I will say Threadbare Excuse out of them. While I didn't love this, I, I like Threadbare Excuse the best. So I agree with you on that. <laughs> I like his description of, um, you know, he has a, a low but piercing voice. It's very like, and then it gives a list of some of his excuses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I missed the bus. I've been sick. Nobody else did it. Like <laughs> the page was torn out. So I, I always like that. It, it feels very evocative. Yeah, definitely. Um, and especially like not only are those excuses in the first place, but the fact that he keeps repeating like the same four. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's really damning about that. I was like, well, shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, those excuses. Right? Oh, <laughs> They're not threadbare. There's a lot of more use left in me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, they, uh, they wind up being um, rescued by the two kings who are here with all of their peoples, their peeps. Um, <laughs> from his tiny wagon, Dr. Discord hurled explosion after explosion to the delight of Soundkeeper while the busy din collected them almost at once. In honor <laughs> of the occasion, Chroma the Great led his orchestra in a stirring display of patriotic colors. Everyone Milo had met during his journey had come to help. The men of the marketplace, the miners of Digitopolis, and all the good people from the valley and the forest. <laughs> and the spelling bee is flying around yelling charge and then spelling charge. <laughs> Everyone's got their thing. <laughs> good. Um, so rhyme and reason are reinstated. Um, they and Milo and his uh, compatriots are declared heroes of the realm. 
mm-hmm. and everything is returned to where it should be. And everything, it's a, it's a happy ending. Um, and there's meals and songs and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and so Milo has to return home. He realizes suddenly that, like, I've been gone a while, actually. I hope nobody's worried. <laughs> and I was just like, he says, I think it's been weeks. And I'm just like, kid. You've been gone weeks and you hope nobody's worried. Your parents are probably a wreck. Although I did probably, I did expect that he would come home and no time would have passed. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking like this kid, like, ooh, get your butt whipped when you get home. Damn. (laughs) Um, I like that it's just that he's, you know, he's kind of a thoughtful kid too. Like, oh, goodness. Like, because you know, other kids in, in this sort of fantastical situation would not really be, they'd be like, I'm a star. Look at me. I'm king shit of, you know, ma- ignorant mountain. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. What a different story this would be if it were Dudley Dursley who found his way to here. <laughs> exactly. Just taking over all the like letters. <laughs> oh my God. I love this idea. I just want to run with this now. <laughs> Eating all the subtractions to do until right. you uh, disappear. <laughs> What's happening to me? <laughs> well, messed up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he uh, he takes his little car and he gets his little coin to go back through and he winds up in his bedroom. And the world suddenly looks to be a lot brighter than it used to. And he's just mm-hmm. like, wow, color. Look at this place. This is so amazing. <laughs> and everything just seems more interesting and he's just like engaged with the world in a way that he has not been and he comes home ready to get back in his little car and go back because he's like you know wondering how everything is going and he comes home and the the toll booth is gone Mm -hmm. it's like it's done it's done its work what the hell like he's just (laughs) you know really crestfallen but then he has a moment and he's like, you know, the, the note that's left there is like, we've figured somebody else can use this. You've made your trip and that's all well and good. And we hope that you've gotten what you needed. And there are some lands that are still yet to visit, but we're quite sure that if you really want to, you'll find a way to reach them by yourself. And he has a moment of, thinking about all of the places in that land that he won't be able to see again. And maybe he could try and find a way back. And then he says, well, I would like to make another trip, but I really don't know when I'll have the time. There's just so much to do right here. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the book. And it's perfect. (laughs) (laughs) It, it really is. It's, it's just like, it does exactly like, what you would hope it would do, like, you know, fill, fill the reader, fill the, you know, fill Milo and fill the reader with just the idea that like possibility is literally everywhere, Mm -hmm. wherever you happen to be. And, and in the, like in the last thing that the princesses and um, King Azaz and the math magician tell him is that like, yeah, this trip was totally impossible, but you had the courage to try and that is, that's something that like, essentially like what you, what you can do is measured by what you will do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. If you knew it was impossible to start off with, you wouldn't have been able to do it. <laughs> right. So we just had to not let you know that it was impossible and then you would just figure it out. Mm-hmm. You are only limited by your imagination. It's true in a lot of ways. And this book was written in like what, like the early Mm sixties and it's, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel dated. It doesn't feel a, it doesn't feel like it's aged impossibly well Mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel trite. Um, You know, even going back and reading as an adult, like it's, it, you know, it's very accessible to children, obviously, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like basic, like, Oh, use your imagination. It's just much more clever than that. Yeah, I agree. Completely agree. Yeah, so this was a lot of fun and just like totally outside of what I was ex- I don't again, I don't really know what I was expecting, but I guess just like a more traditional adventure, you know, like and it was just so there was so much happening in every sentence that I really <laughs> had to go down and absorb it more than I thought I was going to and 
Um, but I wish I do wish that I had run across this when I was younger because I feel like I would have eaten this up. <laughs> it's so like it, it like it's one hundred percent like a such a formative book for me as a as a kid, and you know has has followed me on through adulthood. Which if if anything's going to follow you out of childhood, this book is probably a really good thing to do it. <laughs> yeah, true. Um. Well, tell everybody where they can find you as we wrap this up. Where can okay. they? I'm on the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, we are at Over the Tabletop on Twitter, just at Over the Tabletop. We're on Facebook, Over the Tabletop. We are on whatever pod catching device or software you have um, over the tabletop. Uh, if you want to email us, it's over the tabletop podcast at gmail.com. Um, give a listen. Yeah, you know, engage with us. Tell us games you'd like to to know about, that kind of thing. And that's where I am. Yay. <laughs> uh, most of you guys probably know where to find us. Facebook.com slash unspoiled pod, Twitter at unspoiled show, Instagram at unspoiled podcast. Um, I'm going to be doing the new book club list um, over the coming week. So the first week of December, the 2018 or 19 book club list will be going up. The last book of this year for the regular book club is The Last Wish by Andres. On, oh, it's hard to say this first name. A-N-D-R-Z-E-J. Andres Sapkowski. Mm, I hope I'm, I'm butchering it, I'm sure. Um, I don't but feel like I can help. <laughs> it's uh, called The Last Witch, and it is the first installment in um, the inspiration for the video game The Witcher. Oh. Uh, and then the December childhood favorite pick is Bridge to Terabithia, which I've heard is heartbreaking. I am trying to mentally prepare myself for that. But I talked to the author of that on the phone once. Really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Krista, you cannot prepare for that book. Yeah, I have a feeling. Uh, that's the kind of impression yeah. I'm getting from everybody. So I'm like, all right. Um, but yeah, so if you are interested in checking out the new book club list for 2019, I'll be loading it on the Facebook page once it's done. And you'll be also be able to find it at, um, unspoiledpodcast.com slash book club list. So, um, well, thank you very, very much, Erin, for joining me for this. This was super fun. Yay. I'm so glad you liked the book. Me too. I'm always worried that I'm just going to like hate something that is super special to other people. But <laughs> I really like, and again, I wish that I had found this when I was a kid. This might be something that I have to buy for children in my life. There aren't many, but they're going to get loaded with books though. All of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Krista, I would never have spoken to you again. <laughs> Sorry, Krista. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you all so much for listening. And I will see you again in a couple of weeks with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.